Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new lecture within our Jean Monnet Open Online course of European Integration. As you know, this course is offered online, it's open, broadcast on, on YouTube, and it is sponsored by the European Union through the Erasmus Plus program, the European Union's education, uh, education program. And uh, it's very important that we say this every time because of two reasons. First, because of gratitude, uh, uh, acknowledgement of this uh, financial support of the European Union. And the second reason is for the sake of transparency. In order to avoid any conflict of interest, it's very important for you to know who funds this course. Today is a very important day in this Jamone Open online course because today we have a, a very important guest. And today also we have many people connecting from the University of Suchava, from the University of Chernivtsi, and from many other universities. There are now five simultaneous connections on YouTube as well. We are broadcasting this course on YouTube. Today's uh, guest uh, lecturer, Fabio Franchino, is uh, a very important uh, event in the life of this Jamonet Open online course. We, would, uh, we are very grateful to him for having accepted this invitation. Fabio Franchino is a full professor of political science at the University of Milan, and he is... Um, also, um, the editor, one of the co-editors of the Italian Political Science Review, and he's associate editor of uh, European Union Politics, two very important peer-reviewed journals in Europe and globally. It's global reference for European political research. And he studied at the University of Brighton, an undergraduate degree, and then he did a master's at Bocconi University in Milan, and he, he did his PhD at the London School of Economics. And he's an expert in government, an expert in EU government. He's author of uh, a book on the executive politics of the European Union. The book is entitled the Powers of the Union, it was published by Cambridge University Press in 2007, and it is the world reference in the executive politics of the, of the European Union. So we are very, very thankful to him. The title of his conference today, I put the title, a generic, generic title, Fabio Franchino on um, European Union policy making, but in fact, this conference is about Fabio Franchino. We would like to know about him, what interests him, about his life, his interests, and uh, he's really the topic of his own of his own conference. And we think we thank him very much for his um, generosity to be here with us uh, today. I, can, I think I can speak on behalf of the University of Suchava, the University of Yash, the University of Chernivtsi, Odessa, Zhitomir, all the universities that are participating in this course for thanking him for, for participating uh, today with us. He uh, now dedicates most of his academic work to research. He dedicates to editing these uh, journals, and he also has important works for the academic community. He participates in ECPR, European Consortium for Political Research. He has been president of, of this uh, organization, and he has been also a promoter of the European Union, the study of the European Union in this broader uh, political science organization. So he's really a top uh, ac academic in the field of European Union political science. And we all thank him very much for his participation today. Surely I have forgotten many things, but after his lecture, 
we will have like a time to ask him questions and to have like a mini interview with him and to learn more about his life and about his interest. Without further ado, um, I give the floor to Professor Fabio Franchino from the University of Milan. Fabio, please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, which is uh, humbling in a way, You've been very, very generous in, in, in presenting me to, to, to your students. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, um, um, to teach and to be involved in this uh, um, exciting new project. Um, I'll start briefly with some sort of a technical apologies. I don't know why my mind, uh, my window cuts and goes a little bit, but uh, I will make sure that uh, you can hear me and uh, probably besides intermittently you can watch me. Uh, it might be something related to the Wi-Fi. Anyhow, thank you very much for reminding me and hi to everybody. Um, and, and thank you for your presentation, uh, uh, Diego. Uh, what I was thinking of doing is, uh, um, I was thinking about essentially um, um, some sort of a um, overview of, 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 of the project that I've been involved in, um, the style, you know, the study of, of the European Union, what I've done, and uh, um, you know, the specific analysis that I've done so far, and then, you know, we might clearly uh, enlarge discussions uh, 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 further to other different topics. Um, also, with regard to uh, international organizations which are involved in the study of politics, um, rightly, uh, Diego mentioned rightly the um, ECPR, which is the European Consortium of Political Research, and uh, uh, we are also part of this important standing group, which is a standing group of the uh, on the European Union, or the European um, Consortium of Political Research, which is um, a group of scholars uh, all across Europe, which study the European Union, and they hold a conference every um, um, every two years. Um, and uh, um, I just have to, to correct a small mistake that uh, uh, Diego made. I mean, I, I've been president of the, of the EPSA, which is the uh, uh, European Political Science Association, which is a similar association to the ECPR, um, which also are in an association of political scientists that study politics is the second larger after the uh, after the ECPR. Um, if you if you have questions and you want to interrupt me, just feel free to to to, to ask. Um, as, as I said, sometimes the uh, uh, the video will come and go, uh, but uh, uh, you know this is something that uh, uh, you know we'll we'll manage to um, to solve. Okay, yes, Fabio, I would like to um, introduce you to the audience. Right? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, now many of them have connected. We have um, Irina Irina Tkachuk in, in Chernivtsi with a group of students. You can you can probably see them now. Yes, I can. Hello. We also have a group of uh, uh, students in Suchava at the University of Suchava that is led by Carmen Nastase. You can see them also there. And we have another group of students at the Faculty of History and International Relations of the uh, Yuri Fetkovich Chernitsi National University. This group is led by uh, Valentina. Uh, and it's also a very important group within our course. And then we have many uh, individual students that have joined, such as Romulus, Gabriela and uh, Claudio that have connected to. And we have also a very important uh, guest today. We cannot see her now. We cannot see her image, but I see that she is connected, Marina. She is connected from Piracicaba, Brazil. It's from the interior of the state of Sao Paulo. You, you know, the Eurosci network at the moment, it's expanding itself. It uh, would like to become a really global uh, network in, in geographically and also in terms of topics. We started in Europe. We started with the European Union political research in Europe. But now we would like to become more global in, in, in scope 
in geographic and, and uh, in topics. And we, we, we value very much also the addition of the University of Piracicaba in Brazil for, for this. So now, more or less, Fabio, you know what you, your audience is. You have a broad audience from people in, in many, most of them, they are in, in Romania and Ukraine, but there are also people from other places. And there's also some people on, on Facebook that you can, they can write also comments. If they write uh, on the Facebook uh, chat, I will, um, I yes, will let you know the questions that they make. There are now five different uh, connections also simultaneously on YouTube. So the floor is yours, Fabio. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, so essentially, as I, I, just, I just said earlier on, I'll, I'll start briefly to tell you what um, um, the type of research that I've been doing and uh, the sort of research question which I've tried to to address. Um, essentially, um, starting with uh, you know, what is called the, um, some would call it the baseline theory of, of the process of European integration, which is uh, um, a set of uh, uh, expectations and, and uh, uh, mechanism that um, are used as, as the as so-called the baseline. Okay, what we should expect as a, ba a baseline when we study uh, the process of European integration and when we study uh, the institutions of the European Union. So essentially, uh, th this goes, uh, uh, you know, this theory has a complicated name. Unfortunately, we do use to, you know, we tend to use a lot of uh, complicated terminology sometimes in the study of the European Union, which is not very useful, but the, the building blocks are simple. Um, and, uh, um, and the, the research question that they try to address are important because uh, they are important because they allow us to really uh, understand in detail what's going on uh, in Europe in terms of uh, um, um, uh, institutional developments and, and uh, um, uh, European integration. Uh, the, the name of this theory um, um, go, it's, mm, goes back to Andrew Moracic, which is uh, uh, currently um, um, a professor of political science at Princeton. And the name of this series is called Liberal Intergovernmentalism. And uh, um, the reason it's called liberal is because uh, you know, it, it differentiates from other theories in international relations, uh, realism, for instance, of constructivism, uh, because it looks really at what goes on within, within countries and, uh, uh, and how that might affect the attitude of countries to join and affect the design of international organizations. Um, it says it, it is called also intergovernmentalism. The reason is because it focuses a lot about governments, a little bit about less about supranational institutions, which, however, do play an important role uh, in Europe in terms of the process that they have played in in in, uh, um, in 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 the politics of the European Union. Um, very briefly, what what is this theory is about? Essentially, this theory is about uh, um, three important steps, uh, which are the baselines, which are very important when we want to understand uh, important decisions taken at the um, um, European level. Uh, the first important step is, is uh, uh, the study of, uh, um, one can call it preference aggregation at the national level, okay? How essentially um, uh, preferences towards uh, uh, different policies, uh, um, towards different institutional designs, towards different uh, um, uh, um, um, distribution of powers are formed at the national level. Okay, so this theory really starts with looking at the process of preference ag aggregation at the national level, and essentially what government wants, what important social actors want, such as uh, you know, exporting industries, import competing industries, uh, trade unions, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it is the study of, of the aggregation of preferences at the at the national level, and uh, so this is the first little, that is the this is the first step in the in this theory. 
By the way, if you have any question, do interrupt me, okay? Feel free to, to just interrupt me and ask any sort of clarification. I think it's clear what you just uh, said now. <clears throat> but I'm happy, I'm happy to just... You uh, said that you fine. want to understand how the EU works on a broad uh, uh, basis, like the baseline theory of the EU, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And uh, that uh, liberal intergovernmentalism thinks that the decisions are taken by by sovereign governments but each of those governments depends on the internal politics exactly some countries for for determining their preferences right exactly exactly good so essentially this is the first steps in in the process of of, of european integration then the second step what happens the second step is essentially governments meet at the supranational level in brussels and they negotiate among themselves uh, to adopt specific policies, okay? So the important, uh, really important step to understand what happens in Europe, it's really looking at the bargaining that take place at the, um, at the, um, at the supranational level, okay? So at the, um, uh, you know, the different head of state and government, different ministries, they negotiate the different policies. Now, what, what, this is imp what, what is this important to understand when th this bargaining occur? Well, um, there are at least three important factors that need to be um, analyzed or need to be taken into account when we study bargaining at, this, at the supranational level. By the way, when we study any sort of bargaining, not only bargaining in, in, in the process of European integration. But these are at least three important factors that, uh, it, you know, that we need to have a look at, okay? Um, um, because at least they help us to explain a, a part at least of the, of the decisions which are taken at the national level. The first important factor is uh, um, um, what happens if there's no agreement, okay? And uh, um, uh, imagine a group of ministers that negotiate uh, on a specific Now the sound is not working, Fabio. It will probably come back because we have had these problems before. But now we cannot... Uh... We cannot hear you. Gabriela, can you hear him now? No. This has happened with the connection. It comes and goes, but it will eventually come, come back again. Also, Marina in Piracicaba. Marina, can you hear us? Marina, hello. I think Marina's connection is not uh, not working very well either. But our connection works. We have experience. Uh, Claudio. Yes, we, I are, do, yeah. we are broadcasting on YouTube now. And the connection, the transmission works. Only individual connections sometimes they stop working. But the main connection is working and I'm watching also simultaneously. I have two screens and it is working also on, on YouTube. We have several people watching on YouTube too. And um, <clears throat> what do you think about what he just said? He, he, you see, he looks like a genius, like a genius, crazy genius that's difficult to understand. What do you think? Yes, it's a quite uh, interesting uh, discussion. Hello? Obviously, uh, he knows okay. everything. He, he's back now. Uh, sorry, apologies. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I got a disruption in the in the um, connection. Um, so, um, where was I? Um, essentially, I was uh, I was at the stage of uh, um, the power of veto, right? Yes, you were in the saying that countries need to negotiate among themselves. You didn't even reach the, the veto or anything, just... Ah, okay, okay. So essentially, the, when, when we analyze uh, uh, negotiation in the, uh, in, uh, uh, among different uh, um, um, 
um, governments, there are essentially three important factors that we need to um, have a look at, okay? The first one is uh, uh, what happens if there's no agreement, okay? Um, what happens when there's no agreement is, is important because uh, uh, the government that cares the least, okay, about adopting a specific policy is the one which is more powerful, okay? Uh, and essentially is the one who has the factor, the power to veto. He says, you know what? If you do not uh, adopt a policy which I like the most, I will veto a specific measure that is adopted, and, and I, I will say, I, I will be okay with the outcome of this veto because uh, um, um, uh, the, the non-agreement is not particularly bad for me, okay? Um, this is a very important aspect in the study of these negotiations. So essentially, the, um, the, the government who is uh, um, better off by the best alternative to a negotiating agreement is a very powerful government in this negotiation. Okay? Is that clear? Yes, yes. The, your image has a free, a frozen. I know. I mean, I can go back to my image, but uh, yes, we can we can I hear you. We I, can I was slightly, no, I can't go back to my image. I was slightly concerned that uh, if I turn it off, is you know the, the Wi-Fi goes off, so I don't know why, but uh, it should be okay now. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is the first important aspect that need to be considered. Then there is so this is essentially the best alternative to negotiate uh, to the negotiated agreement gives a power of veto. Um, what is important is that this power of veto, you know, sometimes it depends on the, the specific procedure which is used, okay? Um, sometimes the power of veto can be held by, um, by a, a single government, especially in case of unanimity, but sometimes when you only need to qualify majority voting, the power of veto is, is, uh, is uh, you no, know, it might be held by, uh, um, you know, you need a minority coalition to block a specific measure, okay? So, uh, it's not necessarily uh, the government who benefit the most from uh, a non-agreement, but there has to be a, a coalition, a minority coalition that blocks a specific uh, um, uh, agreement. So, why are these actors important? These actors imp are important because you need to convince them, okay? You need to get to have them to say yes to a specific agreement um, for the adoption of a policy. So their positions, their views, and so on and so forth are important, are likely to shape the, um, the policy, the outcomes of this process of negotiation. Okay? So this is, this is an important uh, um, aspect that needs to be considered when we analyze uh, these negotiations. The other important aspect, which is also crucial, is uh, um, what uh, um, no, what is what is uh, uh, in in liberal or intergovernmentalism is normally called the possibilities of of uh, um, uh, coalitional alternatives. Okay, um, whether there are a bunch of other states which can uh, uh, pursue um, other policies among themselves and, and exclude others. Okay. And uh, these uh, um, coalitional alternatives underpin, give an important power, which is so-called the power of exclusion, okay? So the power of exclusion is important because uh, um, essentially you impose a cost to other governments, okay? So this is also a very important aspect that has to be understood when you study these dynamics of negotiations. I will give you a very clear example of how the power of exclusion works, just to understand why it matters so much. Um, towards the end of the 1990s, uh, uh, you know, the then 15 members of the European Union were getting ready to get into, to, to, to get into the Economic Monetary Union to adopt a single currency. Okay? And there was a very complicated procedure uh, to, to, to adopt a single currency. There were a set of criteria which were defined in six, no, in, rather in detail in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Treaty of Maastricht. However, um, eventually it was uh, uh, a responsibility of the Council of Ministers to um, um, accept 
or reject membership of a country into the uh, um, economic monetary union, accept or reject the adoption by that country of the euro. Okay. So essentially, those countries had a power of excluding others to be member of the uh, economic and monetary union. And uh, as a result of that, since uh, clearly the words, uh, um, some member says, has the specific power of exclusions, uh, the um, um, adoption of the um, economic and monetary union was made conditional to the adoption of an important policy, which is now called the Growth and Stability Pact. Which, we, which was adopted towards the end of the uh, um, uh, uh, of, of the 1990s, around 19, in 1997, and that was adopted because, uh, uh, especially, let's say, Germany and in other countries said, you know what, if we don't adopt these policies, we you know we might exercise our veto and we might exclude countries wanting to join the um, um, economic and monetary union. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes, yes it's uh, let's uh, let the people ask uh, questions if they like uh, now. Gabriela, we ask a question to you, Gabriela. <coughs> yes. So he, he said that um, in the European Union, in some policies, all the um, member states must agree right to go ahead with some policy but in some cases there is the possibility of exclusion of uh, going ahead without some of them so if you want to make a single currency the euro and if there are some countries that is blocking that the other countries can say we can go along ourselves and you remain outside Exactly. Essentially, the power to exclude other countries, uh, uh, give them, you know, give, give, give the, them the, the possibility of adopting specific policies. Okay. Yes, and uh, Fabio, so so, um, do do you think uh, it, this is also a very important debate nowadays in Romania, right? Right, yes. This idea of the, um, like, uh, to speed Europe, right? And the possibility of excluding some countries. So Romania, for instance, is outside the Eurozone and, and it's also outside the Schengen area. Exactly. So, so sometimes they, they feel uh, left outside. They don't like it very much but that it's also something that like to the possibility of excluding them it's something that presses them to to undergo certain reforms but exactly. do, do exactly. you think do you think this possibility of a two speed europe in the end it's something positive beneficial or negative for europe well i mean uh what, what would be the alternative? In a way, you see, I, I think Europe has to be a process that accommodates uh, uh, the desires of some governments to pursue uh, further integration, so adopting uh, specific policies, more integration policies, but also accommodate the fact that there are some other governments that uh, uh, are not keen in, in adopting some of those policies. So uh, I think the idea of accommodating a variety of different positions, uh, some governments are going to pursue further, some governments that are not keen to, to, um, to, to join these uh, common policies, I, I think it's a, it's a major flexibility. So, so in, in, in my view, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's not negative. It's, it's actually, it's, it accommodates uh, the variety, the heterogeneity, the, the, the different positions of different governments. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, um, um, you know, there are some governments who stay out because they, because they want to stay out and, and they don't see any prospect in the future of adopting specific policies. I mean, you know, Sweden is not going to adopt the, 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 uh, um, the, the euro. So, so that's, uh, uh, I think, I think 
a European Union that accommodates also the position of the Swedes that don't want, or the Danes that don't want really a common currency, I think is a better than, than, than a European Union that somehow uh, obliges them uh, to, to do so. So in, in a well, way... Well, I, I think I understand the point. So you think this flexibility is, is, is possible? possible. Because it allows... It allows... Oh. oh? Yes? There is There's some... some... Hello? Yes, I can hear you. But did you open YouTube or something? Because there's some echo now. No, I mean, I don't, I don't hear any echo. Any echo. Okay, good. So the, the, what I said that you, you mentioned it was good that uh, this uh, two-speed Europe offers flexibility to accommodate differences, that in some cases these differences can be impermanent. Do, do you think that uh, they, they can... If we also have students from Ukraine now, many students from Ukraine, and the the association agreement that Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, other countries has have and have had in the past, sometimes can be seen as a preparation for joining, or it can be also seen as a permanent status, right? Such as countries that are close to the EU, but uh, do not become uh, members. Do, do you think this uh, two-speed Europe is uh, something, you said it, you think it's something good. Now, the question is, if you think that is something just temporary, or you think uh, in the case of Ukraine, for instance, uh, if this association status is, is temporary or permanent, uh, well, okay, um, this is a, a rather delicate question because clearly it, it uh, um, um, the, 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 let's say, the, the temporal dimension of these uh, disagreements uh, uh, depends very much on, uh, um, A, uh, the extent to which uh, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, is, is, is willing to uh, and, it and can, in a way, um, uh, adopt the different measures that are necessary to join the European Union. And the second, uh, it is also rather delicate measure, matter, is the extent to which enlargement is, uh, is um, let's say, accepted within, within uh, uh, the European Union, public opinion, broadly speaking. In a way, this is a delicate. This is the this is the delicate balance. So, um, to tell you this, so considering both the stage at which Ukraine is now, um, um, which I, I'm not clearly an expert of, of, of Ukrainian policy, so I said that is what I know from from reading, uh, uh, you know, newspapers. Some some some. Uh, um, I, I cannot say this as, as a scholar of clearly of Ukrainian policies, but um, given the situation with Ukraine is now, and also given the situation in which the European Union is now, um, which is, uh, I mean, the European Union is not in great health right now. <laughs> I mean, we cannot say that it's in great health because it is negotiating the first country which is officially, leave, the process for the first country which is officially leaving the European Union. So it's negotiating Brexit uh, on one side. It is also clearly facing a significant upsurge in what is called Euroscepticism. Euroscepticism takes different, uh, you know, different forms and shapes. Uh, uh, there are you know, a huge varieties of, of, of Euroscepticism, but it's undeniable that in the last 15 years there's been an increase in skeptical attitudes towards the European Union. And third, which is also important, is clearly uh, there, is, there are some, uh, uh, you know, just to be generous, there are some worrying developments in some existing uh, Central European uh, uh, um, uh, uh, countries in terms of, uh, um, um, let's say, democratic consolidation. I mean, what it seems to be that in Western Europe, there's been a, a spread of uh, uh, Euroscepticism. I mean, Italy is the first... Uh, uh, full uh, Euroskeptic government that Italy has ever had. Um, and, but, you know, there's the spread of Euroskepticism in all Western Europe. 
And clearly, th there's been some regression in, in democratic consolidation in some uh, uh, Central European countries, like Poland and Hungary are, are the classical example. So I, I, given these situations in Ukraine and in Europe, I, uh, I, my expectation is that uh, um, uh, the agreement within Ukraine and European Union is likely to stay as it is for the foreseeable future. Yes, also I have another another question related to what you just mentioned. You you mentioned Brexit. Yes, exactly. Brexit is something quite uh, new, right? And also you were mentioning before this idea of, of, of countries that can be excluded and Brexit means also that countries can exclude themselves from the yeah. from the Union. Do, do you think that Article 50 and the possibility of countries to withdraw from the EU is beneficial for for the European Union or not? So, it, in a sense, this this question, if you think that the possibility of divorce, allowing divorce, is beneficial for the quality of marriage or not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is <laughs> I like your analogy. <laughs> um, Let's say, I mean, continue your analogies. I think that the possibility of divorce improve the quality of marriage. <laughs> um, so um, le let's go back a little bit. Let's take a step back. Of when are the origins of Article 40? The, the origin of Article 40 is that specific article was designed uh, really, um, frankly, taking in, 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 into consideration possible negative developments in Central and Eastern European countries. So those countries which have a um, 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 shorter history of democracy and which might slide back into, uh, into uh, um, um, an authoritarian regime. Okay? And those countries, may, for whatever reasons it may happen, might apply and say, you know what, they want to leave. Okay, or or uh, so this is different from the sanctioning mechanism, which is uh, which is in in uh, uh, which exists within the European Union. But you know, for whatever reason, it could happen that they they that there's, there's uh, uh, you know sometimes there are some democracy that collapse. And if we have uh, you know we are political scientists. We do know that democracy sometimes do collapse. And and so actually, interestingly enough, that that article was designed in light of the fact that there might have been some democracies in the Central Eastern Europe which, which might have been fragile and might have gone back into uh, um, uh, a less democratic uh, um, um, regime. And so in a way it, it was surprising that it was used by by far the most established uh, uh, European democracies, the United Kingdom. But you know, to tell you the truth, I do really think that uh, the existence of that uh, um, um, of, of, of that article, um, it does offer the, uh, no, the, the, the message that, okay, fair enough, it, essentially what it does, it, it, it regulates a process of secession, okay? And uh, um, secession is common. Uh, you know, in Europe we had, uh, no, the Yugoslav war was a war of secession in a way. Uh, the, the separation between, in Czechoslovakia, the separation which in, between the Czech Republic and Slovakia was was secession. So secession, you know, is 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 a process that happens. In Spain is a case where there's been attempt in secessions. Quebec in Canada is an attempt of secession. So in idea the, the, the philosophy behind Article 40 is okay, I mean it might happen that uh, uh, some you know, some country might want to leave. And so in a way is 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 a process to regulate the process of secession. So you know, in a way, I think it was it was uh, um, uh, no, it, it was better to have it regulated by like that. Also, because to tell you the truth, I mean, from the perspective of of the remaining countries, it is a procedure that gives considerable power to the to the current member states. <laughs> I mean, that must must, must have to you know, has to be said. The way that Article Forty was designed, it gives you no know, significant power to 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 the, the bargaining power. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the living country, and uh, clearly, you now that what you would expect, you, you know, you would adopt a procedure that give yourself uh, 
the most possible leverage, and that's what they have done. And uh, um, so, you know, I think it, it gives uh, um, the idea that if you want, you have to leave, but clearly also to the remaining member says you said that, you know, if other country leaves, you, you know, you will have enough power to control this process. Um, and and I, I think, you know, my, my idea is, is uh, um, uh, it was appropriate. And it, at the end of the day, it, uh, it uh, um, uh, given all the complexities and the huge difficulties of Brexit, um, at least is slightly regulated, okay? Rather than being completely illegal. I mean, by illegal, I mean completely outside the framework of the treaty. I, I think you so, uh, so essentially you think that the this article 50 is uh, good for for democracy in Europe right um, I, I would I would say that it is a, uh, it is a, a procedure to regulate secession uh, which is uh, uh, I mean I, I wouldn't want, I, I don't know whether whether it is good for democracy but it, it's a procedure to allow uh, if countries democratically decided to leave the European Union as the UK did, it is a process that regulates this process. And yes, because you, you know, sometimes, but this could also apply to marriage. Sometimes some people said, you know, Hirschman. Hirschman, uh, he used to say that this possibility of exit, sometimes if you have it, you don't uh, take so much effort in trying to use uh, voice trying to make your marriage work. If you have the possibility to, easy possibility to leave, to withdraw from the EU, you will not spend so much effort in trying to reform the EU. What do you think? Okay, um, this is interesting. Let's apply this to the case of the, um, of the European Union. Uh, you know, if, if, we, we, if we are no, as scholars of the process of European integration, I think that you would agree with me that uh, um, the United Kingdom has used voice a lot <laughs> in, in the past 30 years. I mean, you cannot say that uh, uh, the, the British government has played a crucial role in many important decisions. Um, so, so um, he has act. He has played an active role, but you know, frequently a very constructive role, um, um, and sometimes a bit of a disruptive role. So the fact that uh, um, you know they, the United Kingdom, the British government has exercised voice frequently, um, and uh, um, so uh, no, I, I'm not sure whether that would apply in any specific context. Um, the second is that uh, um, um, I'm not sure as to whether it is so, let's say, um, costless. Okay. Uh, live in the European Union. So the exit option, I think what we have learned in the past, uh, uh, you know, since the Brexit referendum is actually, uh, I mean, we as experts, we knew that, but I say, uh, I think it's very clear that since the Brexit referendum, there's been a public recognition of the cost, okay, a public realization of the cost of exiting. So in a way, the past two years has been really a process of, of cost revelation. Okay, and 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 and, and uh, by the way, and, and if you are happy about leaving, you can. Well, I'm happy. I will leave. I will. I'm happy to pay the cost, and that's fine. But uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that the, that by just a simple procedures um, insert uh, an article inserted in the treaty necessarily reduces the cost of exit. What it does is regulate the exit process. I don't think it actually reduces the cost of exit because the cost of exit, as we know, is related to the, the regulatory infrastructure which underpin the European Union. So, 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 so if I understood right, you 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 said that um, the intention of this article is not to reduce uh, democracy, voice, the use of voice inside the Union that the UK. And the EU have tried to resolve the, the differences for a long time. And it's all, only a procedure for exceptional cases when the marriage does not work anymore to, to allow divorce in a civilized manner, in a regulated manner, right? 
Exactly. In a way to minimize, I mean, there will be disruptions, but at least in a way to regulate the disruptions and not to uh, create, create further legal uncertainty, because this process is going to, you know, it, the essence here is legal uncertainty. And, and um, exit, Brexit will lead to legal uncertainty, so you want to minimize the uncertainty uh, related. Yes, and related to this, you, you think, uh, Fabio, that... Um, you know, the scholars of, of, um, of Europe, they have usually uh, studied the process of European integration. Yes. And they have tried to understand this process from a scientific perspective. And the, our theories, the um, scientific uh, theories that we made were about European integration, right? Yes, exactly. But, but nowadays, in some cases, such as in the case of Brexit, we are analyzing the opposite process, European disintegration. Do you, do you think that the, this can also like, uh, be um, scientifically analyzed and it would help? For instance, if you, if you are a, a civil engineer, you learn how to make buildings, how to build, but you also learn how to demolish buildings scientifically, in order to avoid any disruptions. Do you think that uh, the, the, the scientists, the experts in European integration could also help in the process of uh, European disintegration, such as Brexit? I think, I think you're perfectly right, in a sense, uh, for two reasons. This is clearly um, a unique event, and it is a challenge to, 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 um, to scholars. Um, why, first of all, why is it a unique event? Um, by the way, it's a unique event not necessarily, not only at the regional level, by regional I mean at the continental level, it's really very much a unique event, I would say, at the global level. Um, um, at least, uh, um, as far as I know, this is the first country since the Second World War, which has, uh, I mean, many countries have left international organizations, but this is uh, uh, the, the first example when a country has left an international organization of which it was so deeply embedded in, okay? Um, I, I, you know, you can't leave bilateral treaties that then don't say much, but this is clearly the first example where a country has left an organization which has a, a, a very deep organization, okay? So this is really a unique event. And uh, what you write from, from scholars that studied it, this process, um, it is interesting because normally the approach that we have toward this analysis is that, well, countries agree to uh, adopt treaties, uh, uh, multilateral treaties, join international organization because they see a benefit into doing so, okay? So essentially is a, is a, is a value-adding benefit, okay? Um, it, it's a, it's a, Something is a, is a, what we say is a Pareto improvement, okay? Everybody is going to get something out of, of this, uh, uh, no, of this new common policy, or adopting this new organization, and so on and so forth. So uh, clearly, here is completely different because, because uh, uh, I don't think you, anyone can reasonably say that this is a Pareto improvement uh, because, I know, just if you take the minimum, you no. Know, Econo international economic le lectures one one on one. No, the effect of Brexit will be an increase in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in barriers uh, for uh, um, both, of course, for for the European Union countries and from the UK. And it is very likely that the net effect will be a, a, a reduction somehow in in trade. And it is very likely that is uh, will have a negative impact. I mean, we don't know the. The size of this impact probably is less than a lot of people. Um, 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 like there are a lot of people that said it would be a collapse, uh, probably not to that extent, but it's undeniable that uh, Brexit has a negative impact. Okay, clearly has not a positive impact. It has a negative impact in, 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 the, in the potential growth, in the potential um, trade between the UK and the, and the patterns of trade between the UK and, and the European Union. Um, we don't know the size, but it's cl clearly the sign is negative. So uh, th that is a challenge for the scholars of, of, of the process of European integration, because here you have a bunch of governments 
that essentially decide to arm themselves, okay, in a way, um, at least from an economic perspective. Um, uh, at least they have to take a, a set of measures, they have to raise uh, barriers to trade, okay? Uh, and, and, and those barriers to trade are likely to disrupt trade, are, are likely to be welfare reducing a little bit, okay? So uh, this is, theoretically, this is clearly challenging. But only to a certain extent it is challenging, in my view, because if you analyze how negotiations have been carried out um, by the two parts, by the European Union and the UK government on one side, um, in my view, the position of the European Union has been, uh, um, you know, has been essentially based on two important aspects. Apart from the Northern Irish element, there are two important aspects. One is that uh, um, we won't allow anything which will also, let's say, uh, delegitimize the operation of the internal market within the European Union, first. Second is that uh, we, we will prefer any agreement which minimizes disruption, okay? So any agreement that uh, uh, minimizes disruption is the one which is, would be supported by, by the European Union. Um, so, in a way, this can be explained by the fact, okay, essentially, if you are a government that you are object of a, an external event, a negative external event, the way you behave is to minimize the cost of that negative external event. So, essentially, uh, the behavior of the European Union is, can be explained by, it's like a government, a bunch of governments whose major objectives is to minimize the negative uh, uh, implications of an event that they didn't, con in a way, they 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 they, they were a victim, you know, victim in a way, they, they were victim of, in a way, they they were subjects of those specific negative events. And in a way, uh, even if one analyzes the behavior of the British government, uh, um, and clearly in case of the British government, there are many different dimensions, that there are an identity dimension that have played an important role, there is an immigration dimension that played a role. There's an impact of international trade dimension that played a role, and so on and so forth. So there are a combination of different dimensions. But you know, an important aspect of also the behavior, or at least part of the British government, is also to let's say to be um, to respect the, um, the the referendum because that is a the referendum outcome because that is a matter of democracy and it is always important, but to to comply with the referendum outcome, uh, but at least at also minimize the cost of that outcome, at least, okay? And that is a very difficult pre predicament, I, I have to say. So in a way, even the behavior of the, of the British government can be understood in, in terms of uh, minimizing the disruption of, a, of by complying with a democratic decision. I don't know whether you agree, Diego. Would you agree? I, you know, it doesn't really matter if I agree or not because we 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 are really interested to know about you. In fact, uh, we we ask you many many difficult uh, questions. You mentioned that um, Brexit would um, likely have a negative impact on the UK's economy. But okay, also the European one. What, what would I mean? If we use uh, you no know, basics international trade theory, okay? Um, no, I don't know. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. The 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 idea. Um, because of the audience that we have, many people in Ukraine. I what I like about the Brexit is the symmetry of uh, European integration, European disintegration, and the symmetry of. Uh, mm, withdrawing from the EU and joining the EU. Yes. So, so I think if um, Brexit can be a good indication, if if of what would happen to Ukraine if they join the the European Union, because the what are the costs of leaving are the benefits of joining. And the benefits of leaving are the costs of joining. That is a that is a very nice asymmetry. And you know, you're right in a way. Clearly, there are those are the um, uh, you know, there are two sides of the same coin in a way. 
um, and and um, clearly it can be it is costly also to join I mean it's uh, um, um, one should not uh, um, ignore the fact that uh, uh, the European Union is uh, mostly um, a, a, a regulatory exercise. I mean, most of the policies output of the European Union are regulatory policies. And, and uh, some of those policies can be costly. I mean, uh, especially pursuing some environmental policies can be costly. Um, environmental standards, food standards, um, pharmaceutical standards, all, all those are um, 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 regulatory policies that might be uh, that impose costs on some industries. Uh, and there's a big debate about whether, uh, you know, they're appropriate or not, if they exercise you know, too much cost or not, but it is in a way you're right. I mean, I do agree with you that is, that is uh, costly. The, the benefit, uh, clearly, from, 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 uh, from uh, the perspective of, of, of joining countries is normally traditionally be uh, more trade, movement of persons, that has been also you know, clearly very more important, even though we do know that that has been delayed. That is a very politically delicate um, 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 issue. But clearly, remittance related to uh, the movement of persons has also been an important uh, benefit, in a way, related to joining the European Union. And the third one, uh, traditionally, uh, has been, as you know, um, the consolidation of democratic practice in the in the member states joining the European Union, even though that we know that you know, now we are in a delicate situation in Europe because there are some countries uh, which are, are challenging those practices and and at the way that uh, the European Union uh, um, parties in the European Union European Union institutions are dealing with these. Uh, um, Problematic processes uh, is you know it's will you know will tell a lot about how how the European Union operates. I I also have like um, question about your research interests, right? Okay. And and the evolution of yourself as a researcher, right? Because. Uh, when, when I believe that when you started um, in European Union related research, you were interested to learn how the European Union works. For instance, you, you published this book about um, delegation and uh, the powers of the European Commission, the executive power of the European Union, yes, delegation and control uh, principles and agents in the in the European Union. And um, at that time, the scientific study of the EU uh, was mostly concentrated about how the EU works, right? And um, how it works now, right? And, and I see that Many, many academics evolved, many scholars al along the, the life, they go from these simple questions about how the EU works to more complicated questions of, about what the future of the European Union will be. It's the big questions, yes? And I see that you, you now, you mentioned the Andrew Moravchik, right? liberal intergovernmentalism and I see a change in you that you are moving like from the field of comparative politics to the field of international relations is, is that right is that something common in in scholars that with age you you approach more complex issues uh. Okay, um, let, let me let me answer these into the in, in two way. Um, uh, okay, uh, one would say that one 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 of the objectives for for uh, scholars would be yes, try to uh, address uh, uh, more you know challenging and complex issues as they uh, no as they you know, mature. Yeah, that's tough. That, that that could be. I mean, that is that is uh, um, could be a, 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 a reasonable development. Um, probably uh, issues that you think that are important to explain, um, no, 
specific dynamics that you care about and think are, are important. Um, so that, that, that would say, yeah, probably I would, I would uh, um, um, agree with your, the way you characterize this development. And with regard to what you said about this division between international uh, liberal intergovernmentalism, comparative politics, and so on and so forth, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit less uh, um, convinced as to whether now the, um, the, no, the scholarship on the European Union um, necessarily works by this label anymore. Okay, uh, what I'm trying to what I what I try to say is that the um, all these theories in, in, in offer interesting and important uh, um, building blocks, explanatory mechanism to um, to explain something which is relevant, which is important. So let's say, uh, um, I think defining oneself as a comparativist of, 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 of one belonging to a specific, um, let's say, field of branch of international relations, I think that is, people don't do that anymore, okay? Um, I think more than anything, there's been an agreement in the fact that uh, each theory allows us to at least importantly understand um, um, some salient aspect of the phenomenon that you are analyzing, okay? So I, I tell you, for instance, with regard to liberal intergovernmentalism, in a way, uh, I always, even in my book, in a way, with the one about uh, the, the, the power of the union, what it is about, it is not, I, I didn't complete the description of liberal intergovernmentalism because the next, the third step, okay, after negotiation, the third step in liberal intergovernmentalism is adoption of institutions, is the design of policies, or the design of policies that uh, at least make sure that uh, member states or governments credibly commit to the to the objectives that they agreed on, okay? Uh, and hence all of this theory of delegations, uh, the compliance system and so on, policies are designed in order to make sure that if governments agree on doing something, then they you know, they abide by their words when, when, when they have to implement those policies. So in a way, my, my analysis is, is a continuation, is a natural continu continuation of uh, uh, liberal intergovernmentalism in, 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 because it is about how policy are designed, how credible uh, uh, mechanism for having government to commit to policy objectives are designed, okay? Um, and uh, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, other fields in international relations, other aspects of international relations are, are irrelevant. And I give you one example of something which is, you know, of, of a field also international relations, which I, uh, which I, which I never uh, um, contribute to, right? I never uh, uh, um, pay particular, I, I never pay particular attention to, you know, in a way. Um, but if we, um, how can we explain um, voting behavior at the Brexit referendum without ignoring how identities uh, are constructed, okay? So, in a way, you know, constructivism, which is a field in international relations, which I, in a way, I don't really, I, I never contributed to, but let's say um, the, the outcome of the Brexit referendum um, is also uh, the results of identity politics. And, and construction of identity is, cru is a crucial aspect, undoubtedly. So it adds also to explain a part, at least, of that specific uh, um, um, policy, okay? So in my view, probably as you, uh, let's say, in, to better uh, answer your question is that probably as you, as you, as you, um, as you grow older, you are a bit less radical in a way. You're you're a bit less of a Taliban of a specific approach. You are okay, yes, yes. Talking about this, my, I have a question. I am curious about. It's that um, <clears throat> sometimes in academia they are like uh, schools of thought. Exactly. Right? It's like uh, in in this in American politics. You have, for instance, the Rochester School, right? 
and, and, and you can identify some people as members of this Rochester school. If it was something equivalent uh, for, for you, it, would you identify with some school that you belong to? Well, I mean, uh, I, I tell you the way I approach a, a research question, and and that probably uh, I and, and that we probably answer your question. Uh, normally, when when I um, when I when I'm interested in into when I have a puzzle that I would like to answer, I have a specific research question. So I do normally uh, look at theories, and I do normally look, if not sometimes even develop formal theories. Okay. So uh, the way using uh, uh, the tools of game theory of, of, of mathematics applied to politics, uh, um, I find it useful. I have to say that I find it useful because it gives me rigor, um, uh, analytical rigor. It, it, uh, um, it, it clearly clarifies the boundaries, the scope of my research question. So in a way, um, uh, I, I do start either, either developing or relying on this sort of approach. So, in a way, that is that is the Rochester School, Rochester School, right? Uh, and then, you know, from the development of those models, you know, you develop expectations and so on. Then you collect data and you subject them to to corroboration. So yes, my my approach to science is is um, you know it is uh, um, follow that specific philosophy. So, so something like positive uh, political theory, you would call it, or exactly, yes. Exactly, correct. And, and uh, another related question. Uh, and most, um, you know, when I read about you in the Wikipedia, for instance, or with about other important scholars, and uh, and there's always one section that they, they ask about the influences, right? Like, uh, what have been the greatest influences? on someone so if you have a musician and you say his greatest influence has been this other musician or this main painter has had these influences is there anyone that you would like to mention as 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 an influence to you uh, someone with an influence on me an influence on, on your way of of, of po political science your thinking like you are a political scientist, an influence on, on you, like one of the authors, other political scientists, if, if you, maybe not, maybe you said you, you are eclectic, but if there's someone that has made a great uh, impact on you. Uh, well, there is one. Um, um, I, I think uh, is. Uh, um, it might sound strange, but it doesn't really sound strange here. But I think reading uh, um, um, some articles by um, Ken Shetley, um, which then I met when I was at the LSE, then he came at the LSE, and uh, I remember you know, I was invited, I met him, I went to his uh, apartment, I presented one of my formal models to him. Uh, but I think the writing, it, that is interesting because Ken Shetley is clearly, you know, he, he doesn't really study the European Union, he's not, he has never. No, he's not really a scholar of the European Union. But um, I started to read, while I was you know, doing my PhD, at the early stage while I was doing my PhD, um, I, I, was, I was fascinated by, by, by his writing, the way he analyzed the study of Congress, for instance, the, 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 the mathematical approach that he developed in the study of Congress, the idea of uh, um, structure-induced equilibrium that I really liked, the idea of structural induced equilibrium is important because uh, it clearly says that uh, no, it, it says that basically policy outcomes are the result of the interactions of the positions of the actors that take those you know which are involved in a specific game and the rules that they have to follow, and so the interaction between these actors which have objectives and and, and pursue specific objectives and specific preferences and uh, and uh, they behave within a specific institutional environment, the way this interact will produce policy outcome. And this is the idea of structural induced equilibrium by Ken Shetsky. I think that has a huge influence in me mm -hmm. um, uh, because uh, um, it gave me a good structure in approaching you know, the, the, the work that which I was doing. And I have to say the second one, um, which guided me towards the application of, of principal agency theory is actually 
uh, Mark Pollack article, uh, an article on international organization, which was the first really one that applied uh, agency theory to the European Union, and I was very much inspired by his work on this. Uh, so in a way, you know, Mark is actually probably is slightly is my age, so or probably is even younger than me. But clearly, Ken Shetsley had a major impact mm -hmm. in my, the way to approach uh, the study of politics in a way. Good. Uh, I, I also have some questions in the audience, probably too. I would like to to ask you also about you, your personal questions, but only what you want to tell us. You know, like. Uh, what would like to 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 know because this is a unique opportunity for us also to have you here and to ask you if there's something that you would like to tell us about you about you maybe i don't know about your hobbies your interests your family whatever if there's something that you would like to to share with us i'm sure that many many people would be interested in 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 knowing in knowing that what do you say is there something that you want to tell us or maybe some some secret <laughs> um i don't know are there any questions i mean i, I can't say that i'm passionate about wine but that that i don't think that's a surprise i come oh, from you Hamlet, said you're said... passionate about wine you like what uh, you collect uh, wine bottles or what I'm, uh, um, I'm, uh, let's say, um, I'm not really a collector because I think wine has to be drunk rather than kept. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, um, I, I, I think that uh, um, you know there are very few type of wines which really um, improve over time. There is uh, clearly a, a, a curve in, in terms of wine performance. <laughs> <laughs> and there are there are no wines that should be kept for too long in my view. <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, you know, this is uh, 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 well. This is this no. This is what I no. This is nice. This is like you know, I know. I'm familiar with uh, Romanian wines, for instance. Right. I see. Do Do you like uh, Romanian wine? I like. Uh, I never tried Romanian wine. But I tried. Wine clearly, clearly from from Hungary. I mean, there there is there are very good uh, wine from Hungary. I, I've been even for a wine festival in Budapest uh, many years ago with Thomas Koenig. He wouldn't like to say that, but I was with him in in a castle on, on in, uh, um, in in Budapest for a wine festival. But mm -hmm. apart from that, I, I, the students do they have a specific questions? I mean, that I that, that they you know. Yes, they would, uh, Romulus, Claudio, Gabriela, do you can. Can you ask him some Claudio? Yes. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, how can you make uh, the European Union more stronger? Uh, uh, everybody knows that there are internal challenges and external challenges for the European Union. You already mentioned that uh, uh, about the Euroscepticism. Uh, that means the Italian... Uh, Hungarian and Pol uh, Polish, um, and how can you command uh, if you can uh, make uh, uh, some commentaries about the negotiation between the European Union and uh, uh, Turkey? Because uh, I think that is a quite a strategic uh, foreign foreign uh, policy for the European Union when uh, they start with the negotiation with the Turkey. And it looks like uh, quite a big thing to, to, um, to allow the, this kind of, uh, of uh, negotiation. So, thank you. Thank you very much. For, thanks for your questions. Um, no, they're all excellent questions, and they're all very challenging <laughs> questions. Um, let, let, let's... let's Take them step by step. How, how do you make the European Union stronger? Um, okay, by, by stronger, let, the way I would interpret this question is uh, um, the, the European Union has might have specific objectives, international objectives. Can it use its influence in uh, pursuing those specific objectives? Um, 
I think that uh, the the really the strength from the European Union comes from the the collections of different member states put together and exercise their individual strength collectively via the European Union. The European Union has not really tools to exert its influence, I mean, outside, um, which are you know, the classical tools of realism via, you know, threat of uh, uh, military threat or what sort of what type of sort of you know, military related threats uh, of the use of force, but it has significant powers, um, significant economic might and uh, regulatory might um, that can, uh, um, um, and of course also um, financial might that might use that um, to shape uh, um, global events. And he has done so in the past. Uh, uh, in international negotiations, uh, um, in, uh, um, in in international institutions, uh, within the WTO, um, in the Paris Agreements, and so on and so forth. So, in a way, I think uh, um, uh, it, it, it is a very effective. It, it still, in my view, it is a very effective uh, uh, actor on the on the global uh, um, arena. Um, subject to the fact that it's very weak on some areas. Okay. So in the traditional state-like um, 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 policies, um, the use of force and military clearly is very weak, and so that is undeniable. But um, international policy is not only about military strength. It is also about, clearly, this tradition is also a lot about military strength, but it's not only about that. So um, in, in the other areas of trade regulations, uh, um, global environmental policies, uh, uh, global development, uh, I think he has played um, um, an important role. And in order to make it stronger, um, uh, clearly um, the strength to pursue the objectives is a function of the fact that member governments and European institutions, they collectively agree on a common policy to pursue. So that is how the strengths originate, is, is, is common vision to pursue specific objective. Given this, you're personally right, he has to face significant challenges. Euroscepticism is an important challenge. But when I bear in mind that the challenge of uh, Euroscepticism, I think there are different degrees okay, of, of Euroscepticism. There are a huge variety of Euroscepticism. There is the, um, let's say, there is the, the, the extreme is the identity type of Euroscepticism. Um, and and which is you know which is very much developed across Europe and and, and take uh, um, a specific form in uh, in uh, especially in England I have to say which then has led to to Brexit of course that is clearly a very weakening uh, I mean from the European continental European perspective that is weakening and that be, you have a very important member states leaving the European Union that will weaken the European Union so that is a very that is undoubtedly undeniably a um, um, a deleterious, let's say, form of Euroscepticism. But there is there is other type of Euroscepticism. I think I think uh, it's very unlikely the other Eurosceptic uh, uh, Euroscepticism parties across uh, Europe necessarily are willing to pursue the British um, uh, route. Um, so Euroscepticism uh, across Europe take different forms. Um, some it is about identity politics. So uh, essentially, it is about uh, you know protection of uh, uh, um, of the borders and, and the limitation of migration. Um, some it is about uh, the perception that the European Union is um, um, is not democratic enough. So it's about a position about how the European Union operates, the extent to which the decision taken by the European Union are, are, are perceived as democratic and 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 uh, um, and and uh, um, um, legitimate so these are two different challenges I think the identity challenge is very difficult to be faced because if you have uh, some sort of an exclusive identity by exclusive identity I mean I feel French and by by feeling French I feel anti-european okay the more French I feel the more anti-european I feel so this is the sort of called the type of exclusive identity that is a sort of identity that clearly is deleterious, is negative from Europe as a whole, okay? But there is another type of Euroscepticism, which is the, the says that I don't like what the European Union does, I don't like the policies, I don't like how the procedure works. 
That is different because that type of skepticism can be dealt with in a democratic way by adopting new policy, by modifying institutions, by, by, uh, um, by addressing those specific demands, okay? So that is, a, that is a, I would say, that is cons more constructive criticism. Uh, I think not, there may be one more question. Ah, okay. I'm can not I, sure. Can I, can I answer briefly the, about, about the question about Turkey? Um, Go ahead. Frank, frankly speaking, I do not see that uh, the, 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 the relations between uh, Turkey and the European Union are going to deepen, the, the Turkey and the European Union are going to deepen a lot in the new, near future. Um, they, 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 I don't think they are. There, there are many issues inside Turkey and there are many issues inside Europe that see this relation very problematic. So it, it's like to be a very much, I wouldn't call it even a manager convenience, there are very much relational convenience, but I don't. I see improbable to to have that sort of relation to develop further, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you agree or not, but um, uh, the Turkey is the um, the main partner of the European Union uh, in order to stop the immigration right now. So, well, not only not only Turkey. I mean, Libya, Morocco, all the northern African countries. Uh, um, uh, not, there are, uh, imagine all the negotiations that are carried out with sub-Saharan um, African countries. Um, so uh, uh, there are all these agreements which have been signed with, with uh, uh, people living in uh, um, Central African countries and moving to Europe. So, um, no, I'm, I'm not saying that it is irrelevant, the relation, undoubtedly, but what I will see is that it would be, a, a, let's say, it would be some sort of relation which is functional for the for pursuing specific limited objectives. Okay, I I doubt that uh, uh, beyond the current custom union, something more will be developed. Um, I, I think I'm skeptical that that will happen in the near in the near future. Okay, thanks for the, your answer. You're welcome, Gabriela Romulus or the group in in Suchawa, Do you have any any questions? I have a question. Is it possible? Yes, uh, Romulus, please go ahead. Uh, I want to ask him how how uh, he think about Romania. Uh, is it, uh, they are good people, uh, and how uh, he think about a policy about uh, migrants? Uh, skepticism rise these days about migrant migrants. There is a. Uh, uh, in this time, natives think there uh, uh, it must be a policy to to have for this uh, kind of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I um, uh, thank you very much for this question because I think uh, uh, this is an excellent question, especially you no know, a question asked from a Romanian to an Italian, given the fact that there are, uh, if I'm right, there are three million Romanians living in Italy. And, and uh, uh, you know, I do understand your questions, given the fact that, uh, you know, clearly the, the current, uh, 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 let's say, Italian government is a government which has made um, a lot of its, um, uh, its uh, let's say, anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, I have to say, however, that um, a lot of the um, uh, anti-immigration rhetoric, which has also been used by um, uh, parties like you know, the League in Italy um, is, is also be, uh, slightly qualified, okay? Because it is uh, very much a rhetoric, uh, rhetoric anti-illegal immigration, okay? So which is clearly, as has been said, is an immigration that comes mostly from, uh, um, from uh, uh, you know, Northern Africa, no, uh, Central African origins or Northern African origins, or let's say, uh, uh, other other regions, but especially um, is the is the illegal aspect, which is very much at the core of the political debate. So, as far as R Romania is concerned, I mean that is really that is not really an issue. I mean it might seem strange for you, but it is less of an issue because uh, even for a, for a government like the League, you know, it is understood that you know, those are. Uh, 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 European citizens, they are entitled to, to, to uh, migrate across Europe, and those are perceived as, as uh, um, um, legal uh, migrants, 
And so that is less of a problem. Also because I have to say, of the three million um, um, uh, Romanians living in in uh, um, in Italy, the, the vast, vast, vast majority are you know are employed, and so they have uh, um, they have a legal employment and they are uh, they have legally protected status. So there's really no uh, uh, issues of of illegal migration clearly concerning there. Okay, so so. Um, um, I don't see that as a problem. The, the problem is clearly migration from uh, from uh, um, illegal migration, um, and, uh, and and also the related issue of, of asylum seeking. Um, so so from the perspective of, of Romania or of any other European Union citizens, I don't really see necessarily uh, problems because the issues emerge concerning clearly these illegal migrants. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. 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 And uh, I think we are over time already now. Oh, okay. I'm really, really thankful for your participation in this uh, conference. This has been a special event for us uh, within the Jamone Open Online Course of European Integration. And that is part of the activities of the Eurosci Network. As all of you probably know, the Eurosci network at the moment has uh, 15 universities in nine countries. Today we have had connections from several of those uh, universities. And uh, Fabio itself is uh, like uh, an example of how uh, cooperative work in the field of education can, can allow people who, like uh, us in Romania, in Spain, in Ukraine, in Brazil, uh, uh, isolated, we are not very powerful, but together in a network, in a cooperative initiative, we can do great things such as this great uh, guest conference by Professor Fabio Franchino. Fabio, thank you, thank you very much on behalf of all the members of the Eurosci Network. Thank you very much for inviting me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. We are closing now the transmission. We will have next week, every Monday at 11.30 Eastern European time, we have an open lecture broadcast on YouTube. Until next Monday, thanks again for participation and bye-bye. Bye.